So I'm Juliette Galatly and um, I founded um, an organisation called Viva 17 years ago now, which makes me feel horrendously old, um, which is based in Bristol, but it's a national, to be strictly true, international organisation because we have offices in Warsaw and Bristol. And um, Viva very much started with the aim of um, saving animals, actually, because I went around factory farms when I was a teenager and it affected me what I saw and I decided I wanted to do something about it and take myself out of that cycle of cruelty. However, um, I did a degree in zoology, actually, out of fascination for life and later on did the CNM nutritional therapy three-year course actually which is my connection with the CNM so as time went on and I grew older I, I, I developed an interest in the health and nutrition side of what we eat and I formed separate to Viva a charity called the Vegetarian and Vegan Foundation which sits in the same building I'm director of both um, but the VVF only looks at diet from a health and nutrition perspective and I do treat people on a one-to-one -one level um, <clears throat> so I kind of wear two hats the VIVA looks at um, what we eat from an environmental and animal perspective whereas the VVF looks at it only from health and nutrition and in fact today's talk dairy or no dairy brings in from both sides actually um, because partly what happens to the cows we'll explain to you the health arguments in terms of dairy or no dairy because the two things are very much related which hopefully I will make clear in a minute. Um, before I get going into the talk um, I brought along a pad and some pens, you probably all got pens though. Um, if you want a free pack mailing to you, the free pack's got a nutrition wall chart in it which is what I need each day for good health. Uh, we sell other wall charts as well but that's the one we're sending out free of charge just for this talk a nutrition in a nutshell guide, um, a dairy free recipe guide, so they all come free of charge and then these are also free but if you write, everybody who wants this just write your name and address and give me the pad back. If in addition, because that's the basic pack that you'll get for this talk, you're interested in breast cancer and the effect of what we eat on breast cancer as a disease and recipes for people at risk or who have the disease, then write one in nine because that's the name of the breast cancer report that we did. If you're interested in the fish free guide, which is um, uh, it's totally a health and nutrition guide, it's not talking about it from an environmental or animal perspective at all. If you're interested in um, fish free diet from a health and nutrition perspective, then write fish free. And if you're interested in heart disease, which I'll bring into this talk quite a bit, um, then just write heart on it, okay? So they're three very readable guides. Um, and they all are based on reports, by the way, which are fully referenced. If any of you are interested in more scientific, hard-hitting uh, referenced information. And the three websites I put up here, if you want to write down, viva.org.uk is a big big website with lots of information on it on anything vegetarian and vegan basically with a lot of the campaigns information but lots 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 more including everything from where to eat through to nutrition the vegetarian.org.uk is the VVF so that's health and nutrition only so lots and lots of information on there and all the guides you can download free and there's also referenced fact sheets which for those of you who go on to do nutritional therapy um, so, for example, everything from iron to protein, it's all referenced in the fact sheet section under resources. And then vegetarianrecipeclub.org.uk is what it sounds. It's totally free. It's brilliant, actually. It's by far the best recipe club for vegans and vegetarians um, probably in the world, she says. Um, but it has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of recipes, and you can, source by, you can search by ingredient. So if you had broccoli in your fridge and you wanted to make something with broccoli tonight it come up with the recipes for that, for example, but lots and lots of tips and advice, so that's um, a good resource. So if I pass that round, can you just pass it round you during the talk, if anyone wants a pen. Does anyone need a pen, by the way? Nope. Well, they're there if you need them. Okay. <clears throat> so I was invited today to talk on dairy or no dairy, because obviously it's, um, or maybe not obviously, it's one of my specialist interest areas. And something that does fascinate me, from my zoology background, 
the whole thing of what are we meant to do as a species? Why do we thrive on one type of diet and not on another? And I am interested in that from a zoological perspective, actually. Anatomically, physiologically, what are we designed to do over the millions of years of our evolution? And why do we thrive on certain diets and, as I say, get chronic diseases with other types of diets? And so dairy kind of comes into that, um, and it is more easy to explain in some senses than meat, which everybody thinks about more. You know, most people accept that red meat, especially, is not that good for us. Um, so let's start, let's just let's start very quickly at the beginning about milk then, because it is promoted incredibly successful successfully, isn't it? I mean, credit where credit is due. My God, the dairy industry has been superb at marketing dairy as being the most natural product that a human being could consume, to the degree which you will all recognise, because people who are brought up on dairy from practically birth, or often birth itself if they're not having breast milk, you know, they're put onto cow's milk formula right from the word go. So to, in some people's eyes, attack dairy, it's like Americans attacking apple pie. It just can't be done. You know, it's just a massive no-no. So there's a lot of prejudice and propaganda, and that's the starting position often with Vivi and v Viva and VVF, is that, you know, you're struggling to find an even pathway because people are already so prejudiced against even the scientific papers that are coming out on a um, almost, it seems like, a weekly basis now showing us that dairy, in fact, is not good for our health. But it's, it's a difficult road, this one. Even um, though when you're a breastfeeding mother, my, my son's two, I was a breastfeeding, you're made to feel that, oh, breast milk is the best. However, <laughs> all the vitamins and stuff that are put into the formula, yeah. maybe your child won't get that. You know, you're yeah. going to feel that there's mm. a chance you'll be deficient on you. It's incredible. They are very successful. And it comes down to, doesn't it, when you think about it, why are they so successful? Perhaps more than any other product that we consume. And I think it just comes down to the fact that mothers produce milk when we give birth. Therefore, deep, deep, deep in all of our psyches, there is nothing more natural than milk. And, and what they've managed to do is take the most natural thing in the world, i.e. a mother producing milk for her baby, whatever the mammalian species, they managed to take that most natural thing in the world and skew it and say, it's also natural for a human being to drink the milk of a cow. And if you don't drink the milk of a cow, even past weaning, there's something wrong with you. And they've taken the most natural thing in the world and skewed it incredibly successfully to the degree where, of course, it's one of the biggest industries in the entire world. So that is kind of what you're up against when you're arguing against dairy. Can I take questions at the end? Just because there's a short time to get through everything. And I will take questions. I'll leave time. Um, so, in terms of is milk natural, well, going back to it, um, do you remember the um, Little Britain? Did any of you watch Little Britain? <laughs> do you know which sketch I'm going to refer to now? <laughs> where there's a bit where there's an adult male who goes out with mummy and he wants to suckle from mummy when they're at posh do's and things like that and he's going bitty, isn't he? Do you remember that sketch? And of course we laugh at it because it's shocking because what the hell is a grown human being doing wanting to suckle from his mum? And I only bring that up because it's just the fact that that is so shocking to us that it's included in Little Britain. And yet, the thought of a grown man suckling from a cow who's given birth to her calf, somehow we accept as being perfectly normal. And yet, at least she's the same species. At least she's his mother. <laughs> so it's just to try and make you think about this, that what we've been told from being so, so small as being normal actually isn't normal at all. And when we think about it, there are four and a half thousand mammals on this planet. Every single one, one of the things that obviously unifies mammals is a definition of a mammal, is you produce milk for your young. So out of the four and a half thousand mammals, all of them wean, don't they, early on. And with human beings, it depends who you talk to. World Health Organization puts weaning should be naturally in a human at 18 months to two years old to be completely weaned. So... <clears throat> that means coming off milk. <laughs> milk, no matter what the species, was never designed by nature to be consumed past weaning. And yet, how has that industry got it such that mothers who have five-year-olds, seven-year-olds, ten-year-olds are made to feel like social services should be called around if they don't give them cow's milk? 
And yet we know, if you use your logic and not your emotion, we know human beings should not have milk past weaning and they should only, as far as nature's concerned, have consumed human milk in the first place. We are not designed to drink the milk of a walrus. We're not designed to drink the milk of your cat when she gives birth to a kitten. Do you get down there and suckle from her? And if somebody did, you'd think they're a complete psycho. We're not, you know, we're not designed to drink the milk of a, a dog, an elephant, a seal, nor a cow, because a cow is as different from us as those species as I've just mentioned. We are simply not in that family of animals. We are nothing like cows. And so the constitution of a cow's milk is very different from the constitution of human milk, which is why you can't feed a baby straight cow's milk. And in fact, all the money that they spend on producing that cow's milk formula is to change it as much as possible into human milk. <laughs> so it's just to get you thinking really in question what we're told, you know, all the way along that it's the most natural thing in the world and we, they really do sell it on natural, wholesome goodness. And um, when in fact it's, in fact, of all we eat, probably the most unnatural, weird thing that we do. And then coming down to our evolutionary history, which I touched on very briefly, well, we've been evolving for what, 60 million years into what we are today? And how long have we been drinking milk? Well, we started um, consuming cow's milk 6,000 years ago, um, which is the blink of an eye in evolutionary terms. And remember, that through those 6,000 years, the vast majority of us, the vast majority of the world's peoples have not consumed cow's milk. So that even today, three quarters of the world's people do not consume milk past weaning. And I mention that because a lot of people are shocked by that because we've been so ingrained to think that everybody does it, therefore the whole world does it because we do in the UK and Western societies do it, but in fact, most peoples of the world don't do it, and it's because they're lactose intolerant, actually. So they lose the enzyme to digest the main sugar in milk when they're weaned, which, of course, makes sense, doesn't it? It makes evolutionary sense. Why would you need it? But in fact, white Caucasians don't largely lose that enzyme. Um, but three quarters of the world's peoples do. So they can consume milk, of course. You don't die on the spot or anything like that. But they will get cramping farting, belching, um, and so forth, and feel very uncomfortable if they do consume lactose. So it's very interesting. It's just what we've been told for so long, we have to start to question. And if you look at the constitution of cow's milk, think about a calf. Think of the size of a calf compared to a human baby. Think that a cow, a mother cow, naturally would wean her boy calf, her male calf, by a year old and she would wean a female by nine months old. And you think how large that calf has grown, how much that calf has grown in one year. And by two years old, you've got a very big animal, haven't you? Um, so the, the rate of growth is very different from a human being. You think of a baby and how much a baby grows in one year. We're growing for what, 21 years? So it's a much longer drawn out process with a human being. And the energy from the milk, if you like, or the way the milk has been composed by nature, is to concentrate on the brain and the central nervous system. And with a cow, it's very much to concentrate on a lot of skeletal growth, because you can imagine what they have to support very quickly. So cow's milk, for example, has a lot more calcium in it than human milk. It has more saturated fat in it than human milk. It has more protein, casein, than human milk. So there are a lot of fundamental differences between the composition of the two milks. And the reason that I mention that is because it creates some of the health problems that um, we get when we do keep consuming milk. Not on the face of it as obvious as lactose intolerance, but the research is very clear now. It does create some very serious problems indeed. So just to talk very briefly about the cow's life, which I will then go on to link um, with some of these health issues. So, just one thing, I don't know if you're aware about pus in milk, as in that creamy, greeny stuff that oozes out of sores. <laughs> well, because, I don't know if you're aware of this, but cows in the UK, all of them will spend six months indoors, of course, on concrete stalls, and a, a lot of places, like Cadbury's, their farms um, are, are already zero grazing. In other words, they will never graze on grass or be outside throughout their lives. Um, 
When the way that they are farmed, a lot of those cows get a disease called laminitis, which means the hooves are diseased and they're in a lot of pain. And you'll see this for those that are kept outside. If you look now, when you go down the motorway and you see the black and white uh, Friesian or Holsteins, you'll see that a lot of them limp. I guarantee it. The other thing that you'll see is that they have this coat rack appearance in the dairy cows, which the beef cows, those killed for meat, do not have. And this is because dairy cows, the ones kept for milk, they have been selectively bred over the last few decades to produce way more milk than they would do naturally for their calf. So they produce about 10 times more milk than the calf could ever drink, even if the calf was allowed to drink it. So because of that, they've got, they overwork the udder tissue because they're producing way too much milk. And you get breakdown of the tissue within the udder. And so that attracts bacterial infection and you know where I'm leading, that in turn leads to being pus in milk. And the legal limit, by the way, so we're talking about this natural wholesome product, is 400 million pus cells for every litre of milk sold in the UK. And I guarantee you that every sip of milk that you take will contain pus, because that is what UK farming is based upon. Organic. And organic. Because they are also selectively bred to produce way too much milk than they would do naturally. So it makes no difference whether they're organic. And then the next thing that I was going to tell you as well, which again, I, you'll see why it relates to health. Cows are pregnant for nine months, the same as us, before they give birth. And what the industry never talks about is the fact that they only produce milk because they give birth. This sounds odd, but I was doing um, a BBC Two programme and the cameraman said to me, but Juliet, they eat grass and the grass turns into milk. And I said, you missed out a crucial stage here. <laughs> they have to give birth the same as any other mammal to produce milk. And again, the industry plays on that. It never, never says that. So somehow we don't think about it. So the calves are always killed. Well, if they're male, they will be killed usually at one to three days old if they're not going on to the beef industry because a lot of them are unwanted byproducts today, about 100,000 a year. Um, so they'll just be shot in the head and usually fed to the hunt um, dogs. Um, some will go on for beef. Uh, the females, some, it depends on the breed. If she's a pure dairy breed, she'll go on to replace the mother. And the mothers are killed at only four to five years old, actually, on an animal which would much naturally live way longer than that. It's like killing us as a teenager, actually. So what's that got to do with anything? Well, because over the last several years they've now intensified the milk industry so that those animals are milked up until about six or seven months in, into their pregnancy. Then they give birth so they're producing the milk again and then they're milked immediately again. The calf is taken away at one to three days old or whether she's male or female she will then be made pregnant very quickly again so she's milked again say seven months into the pregnancy the reason I'm telling you this is because milk is um, a cocktail of 35 different hormones, including progesterone and oestrogen, which of course is identical to what we produce as humans. It's also got 11 different growth factors in it. The reason it's got all these things in it is because they're meant to be there for the calf. So for example, the growth factors like IGF-1, which you may have heard of, is insulin-like growth factor 1 is there to help direct the growth of the calf. A calf being a very different animal to an adult human being consuming milk. We are not meant to consume IGF-1 in any product. The problem in terms of human beings consuming products that have IGF-1 is that it's linked to prostate cancer in men, which is a hormone dependent cancer largely, and breast cancer in women, which is largely, not wholly, a hormone dependent cancer. We produce IGF-1, exactly the same growth factor, exactly the same molecule. So the receptors in the breast recognise the IGF-1, IGF which is not destroyed by pasteurisation, and it goes through the intestinal lining into the bloodstream and um, latches on to the receptors and tells the breast cells to grow, and they can grow, of course, out of control. IGF-1 is linked to many different cancers, by the way, we know now. There's a lot of science on this if you want to Google it, IGF-1 and cancer. Um, uh, to the degree where they're actually saying the levels of IGF-1 in somebody's blood are a very strong predictor of whether they will get cancer. Um, and that's how serious um, this is. 
The other thing that we do know is that women who have raised oestrogen levels are also more likely to get breast cancer. And the other thing that we know is women that eat a high saturated fat diet are also more likely to get breast cancer. So for example, there's lots of studies on this, again, if you Google it, but one from um, Cambridge University, Sheila Bingham, by the way, um, if you want to Google her, she did this study and showed that saturated fats increased a woman's breast cancer risk by double. So that, that's a huge increase in risk. And we also know that the genetics in the terms of breast cancer, i.e. whether you're genetically predisposed to get breast cancer, only affect at the most, and this is being generous, 10% of cases, probably more like 5%. That means 90% at least, of cases are not to do with genetics. So what is going on when one in eight women now in the UK are at risk of developing breast cancer and it's one in 10,000 in rural China? And we know for sure that if you take that woman from rural China and you put her in Britain, then the chances of getting breast cancer become the same as us here. So we know it's not genetics. We know it's to do with lifestyle. It's not all diet, it's not, but certainly, in my view, diet hasn't been looked at anywhere near closely enough, or to be more accurate, it has been looked at, and there's lots of papers published on this, but it is not getting through to the public. Um, so I've treated people with early stage breast cancer um, who are shocked by the ignorance of their own consultants, for example, in the breast cancer clinics, who know nothing about the links between dairy and breast cancer at all. I mean, absolutely nothing. Less than nothing. <laughs> so when they take the information along, because sometimes I've even say, take the original scientific paper if they really don't believe our summaries. Um, it's, it's shocking. It really is shocking. But there are very strong links now with the contents of cow's milk, the hormone um, content, the IGF-1 content, and the links to various cancers, especially breast cancer in women and prostate cancer in men. So just talking about cancer for a bit, because um, obviously it's such a serious, serious worry because so many of us are at risk from it in, um, in the world. Um, have any of you heard of the China study by Professor Colin Campbell? No. 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 Okay, I'll just write his name as well on because... I'll put these names on, by the way, I'll bring them up for you to Google, because these people are worth Googling. <laughs> um, he wrote a book with his son, who's a journalist, called The China Study. I just say that because it's a very readable book, really easy to read, and it is amazing. The China Study. So it was a collaboration between UK, United States and China, a very unusual collaboration. And the reason that they used China was because there are so many different states, but the people are genetically largely homogen homogenous, so that you're looking at the effect of lifestyle factors on their health as opposed to genetics. So um, it's, it was an amazing study, and literally thousands of papers have come out of the China study, and they're still being published even now. So Professor Colin Campbell is an amazing man who was one of the leaders of, of the China study. Now, so I'm stealing his analogy now in terms of cancer, um, because he said it's like planting a lawn, and I, and I think it's an easy way to understand cancer. He describes it as ma three main processes, which are initiation, which is like planting the seeds. But those seeds can just sit there, can't they, and not grow into grass. And that's what he's basically saying can happen with cancer. In other words, you've got the potential there for cancer, but it does not mean that you will necessarily develop it. So the, the things that develop cancer, or that, sorry, that implant those seeds are called carcinogens, of course, or cancer-causing agents. And of course, there are many, many of those in our environment. But our body has many ways of actually stopping, even though you're exposed to carcinogens, there are many things that actually stop that mutation from happening and going into the daughter cells, because once it goes into the daughter cells, the cancer is sat there. Again, it doesn't mean you get cancer, but it is sat. And many of the things that actually stop that mutation from happening are our diet. So we eat things every day that stop the carcinogens doing their worst. And one of the most powerful anti-carcinogens is the broccoli family of foods, of course. 
Um, so there are many, many things in plants, and if you, all the anti-promoters of cancer in the plant kingdom, none of them are in the animal kingdom, which is maybe telling you something. And there's a brilliant video, actually, a DVD called Stopping Cancer Before It Starts by Michael Greger, if you're interested in this topic. It's not depressing, by the way. In fact, it's the opposite. It's very uplifting. So Stopping Cancer Before It Starts by Michael Greger. Anyway, the initiation, that's that process of putting the seeds in. But they need sunlight, they need rainfall, they need nutrients, etc., to grow. They need different factors. So the next step in the stage of cancer is called promotion. So unless you get those promoters, the seeds do not grow into the grass. And this, in terms of Colin Campbell's work, in his view, is the most important part because what he discovered, there were very potent promoters of cancer and very potent, what he labels, anti-promoters of cancer. In other words, they stop the seeds growing into the grass. Now, in terms of diet... The anti-promoter, no, I'll do the promoters first. In terms of diet, he found one particular substance which was the most powerful promoter of cancers known to humans. And guess what that was? Dairy. I'm just guessing. Because my talk's about dairy. That's <laughs> an intelligent guess. <laughs> it's casein, the protein in dairy. So you're talking about not the casein itself directly giving you cancer. I'm not talking about that here because some foods we eat, like red meat, do cause cancer of the bowels. We've actually seen it under microscopes now, how they mutate the intestinal cells. I'm talking about um, substances that we eat that allow all sorts of cancers to flourish. And it was the protein in dairy that he found to be the most potent promoter of cancer out of everything that we do. Um, the other promoters, by the way, are meat, um, and it was basically animal products. There was no promoter um, as such that was due to eating edible plant foods that were meant to eat. Ah, sorry, except for one. But you see, the, the reason I skewed that in my own head is because I don't see it as natural, as is it was sugar. <laughs> as in, you know, sugar that we buy, uh, uh, not sh sugar in the actual fruit but sugar, processed sugar that we buy. That's a promoter of cancer too. So, um, the anti-promoters, guess what they are? I.e., they stop, actively stop or discourage the cancer from growing. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> yes, green vegetables, cruciferous vegetables. But not just the vegetables though, guess what else? Yeah. It was basically, he said carrots, absolutely right. It was basically fresh fruits and vegetables, it won't surprise you at all. But also very powerful was the nuts groups. Also very powerful was the pulses group, which is all peas, beans, lentils um, and seeds. So it's basically coming back to what I would describe as a very good whole food vegan diet. Sorry. The curcumin. Spices, yes, that's right, herbs and spices. It's basically everything that should be in a good diet. So no surprises there. Um, it's just a reinforcement of what I was going back to at the start of the talk, or just touching on, I do a different talk called Wheat Eaters or Meat Eaters, which looks at our physiology and our anatomy and shows you why we thrive on a plant-based diet and why we don't thrive on one that's based on animal products or is fully omnivorous. So, he looked at initiation, promotion, and the last stage of cancer is called progression. That means the lawn's gone out of control, it's going down your pathway, it's going everywhere that you don't want it to go, and you find it very hard to bring it back under control. So, obviously, he's you know, using that as a, a, a metaphor for the cancer then spreading, and then obviously that can be, and usually is, very bad news. So, that's one of the reasons that... Um, in terms of dairy or no dairy, I would say definitely no dairy um, in terms of it being a promoter of one of the most deadly diseases known to humankind and that affects so many of us now, um, especially in the Western world. What time is it, please? There. Oh, it's there. Thank you. Okay, good. Heart disease I'm going to mention because I... I was going to say, I love working with people with heart disease. That doesn't come out right, does it? Uh, <laughs> I like working with people with high blood pressure and diseases that relate to um, cardiovascular disease because 
if, they, if they're willing, which they are by the time they come to me, to do something, they're so responsive. Um, and that, Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, he's written a very good book, really easy to read, by the way, if you want to Google him. He has done a lot of work on heart disease, um, and he set up a centre where he looked at real live patients. Every single one of them had been practically given up on by the medical profession. That's how severe they were. In other words, a lot of them had been given months or a year to live. Excuse me, so we're talking about severe patients here, severe heart disease patients. Now, just to go back to basics a little bit, he says um, very, very strongly after all the years of research that he's done with real people, is that heart disease is one of the few diseases that is entirely preventable, as in, I mean, entirely 100% preventable by diet, even if you're genetically predisposed, which again is a very small percentage of heart disease. The vast majority of heart disease patients is to do with lifestyle. It's what we do to ourselves in some form or another. And diet has a massive, massive part to play in that. And again, I think it's played down terribly by um, the medical, um, should we just call it industry? Um, not out of malice, it's not that, it, but there is a general ignorance about the part that diet plays. To the degree where I've done debates with people, let's just say, who should know better, who say, no, it's all genes, you know, diet hardly plays a part in heart disease. And, and you're thinking, and you're treating people with heart disease? <laughs> and it's scary how resistant people can be. And I wonder why, and I'm sure you wonder why, because you're interested in diet and nutrition, is this to do with the fact of what they eat themselves? Does that prejudice you to the degree where you can't read something openly? It's just the question I'm putting to you. Because the research on heart disease is very, very, very strong indeed about the part that diet plays. And Dean Ornish, he's run the Lifestyle Heart Trials, so he's very worth um, Googling because his results have been published in The Lancet more than once and taken very seriously. He's um, United States again, both of them are. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about their work. But going back to basis about heart disease, one of the ways that I describe in terms of the coronary artery and supplying the heart, the heart is obviously the most hardworking muscle in your body because if it stops, then you stop, you're in trouble. So it has to keep going. And obviously being a hardworking muscle, it needs a lot of oxygen itself to be happy. So if you start depriving the heart of oxygen, you get pain usually, quite severe pain, angina of course. If then the plaque goes right across or moves and blocks the artery to the heart, then of course it results in a heart attack, which of course can result in death. So one of the analogies I give is like the hose pipe. Imagine your coronary artery is a hose pipe and imagine you turn the water on. I'm sure you all did this as kids, I still do it with my kids, but you imagine the water's free flowing through that coronary artery or the hose pipe and it's got a nice steady flow going through. You put your thumb just a little bit across the edge of that hose pipe and think about what happens, about the pressure that starts to build up in that hose pipe. So you imagine that that's a plaque forming in the artery and you put your thumb halfway across that hose pipe. Now think about the pressure building up in that hose pipe. You can really feel it struggling to get through, can't you, and maintain that nice flow to the heart. And then of course put it all the way across and of course the heart or part of the heart stops beating altogether. So the reason I mention that is because I think sometimes things are overcomplicated. I don't think heart disease in many ways is that complicated. If you damage your arteries, say through smoking for example, so you've got a damaged artery, you eat lots of saturated fat in your diet. Now think about, let's go back to dairy. What's got a lot of saturated fat in it that the British public eat almost daily? Yeah. Hard cheeses are on average 60% saturated fat. That is a lot of saturated fat. Think about butter, 80% saturated fat. Think about chocolates and ice creams and think about the amount of saturated fats that we as a nation consume in our diet. It's incredible. Think about red meats, the amount of saturated fat. Think about chicken. We're sold the line that chicken is low fat. The average chicken people eat today, because 98% of them are factory farmed, the average chicken today has a pint of fat in it. So it's very hard, well it's not hard, but on the typical UK diet, 
it would be very hard to get away from saturated fat because they're consuming an awful lot of it on a daily basis. Think about a pizza that people think has been relatively healthy. <laughs> Three cheese pizza, you know, and so forth. Um, so, lots of saturated fat in the diet from dairy. Um, most of the saturated fat in the diet comes from meat and dairy. Um, the, we do a report which is called Globesity, which is on this website. If you want to have a look at this in more detail, um, it details where we get saturated fat from in our diet. So why does that matter? Well, when you consume saturated fat, it tells your liver to make bad cholesterol, the bad cholesterol. And what that does is that it will, if you've got damaged arteries especially, that's where it fixes to the damage, that's where the bad cholesterol fixes in that artery. So you imagine your hose pipe now with a bit of damage, say from smoking, from alcohol consumption and so forth and so forth, um, and, it, and the bad cholesterol fixes to that point. That then attracts white blood cells who then come along and send out an alarm signal to other white blood cells saying, come here, we've got to eat this bad cholesterol up. The white blood cells engorge themselves on the bad cholesterol. So then you start getting this stickiness with the white blood cells sticking to white blood cells. And before you know it, you've got this plaque forming in your coronary artery, which can take years to develop, of course. And you probably know there have been studies now done on British children who very sadly have died. But we have seen that um, those plaques are starting to form in British children as young as three and four years old now because the diet we're giving them as a nation is becoming so um, junk laden, so saturated fat laden. So you can see how easily those plaques start to form from a bad diet and why bad diet is so much part of forming those plaques. And it doesn't have to be the coronary artery. So for example, this guy, Caldwell Esselton, he, he will describe in his book teaching people, uh, sorry, um, treating people who are in so much pain they can barely walk across the room because it's the artery in the leg where the plaque has formed. Um, in the case of men with impotence, um, the arteries feed the genital area and so, you know, um, what you eat directly affects your performance in bed. There's all kinds of implications of blocking your arteries in different parts of your body. It's not just the heart. Um, so that's something to think about. <laughs> so the nice thing about heart disease in terms of working with it is you can actually reverse a lot of the damage that's done through a good diet. And angiograms where they've actually x-rayed the artery that uh, feeds the heart, you can see the plaque actually dissolving. And one of the things that dissolves the plaques is a diet very high in antioxidants, which is in beta carotene, vitamin C, vitamin E. So you're talking about a diet that's actually loaded with fresh fruits and vegetables. So it's full of antioxidants that then try and um, rectify the damage that you've done through eating badly beforehand. So it's not one of those diseases that's hopeless at all. It's quite the opposite. And it can give you a lot of pleasure working with people and seeing them change and seeing how they get their energy back and how they can heal. So in terms of heart disease then, well, the trials. Oh, the other thing that I should mention that's not talked about very often is nitric acid. Um, nitric acid is produced by the blood vessels and what it does, it acts like Teflon, so it gives your blood vessels like a slippery surface. So the blood can move along really, really nice and easily. So you imagine, um, say in the case of strong emotions, whether it's anger, ecstasy, whatever that strong emotion may be, your heart, through strong emotion, always needs an extra surge of blood to the heart. Um, through physical exercise, you need extra surge of blood to the heart. Sex in itself, you need an extra surge of blood to the heart. So all these things, you need the nitric oxide to be produced like that. Now, when you eat saturated fat, so going back to what we talked about before and where it is in dairies and meats especially, um, it almost immediately affects your production of nitric oxide. In other words, it stops it being produced at the levels that you need to be healthy. So that's another interesting effect of um, fats in the diet. And as I say, it's been measured. Again, if you read his book, they've measured the production of nitric oxide after different meals have been consumed. And so we know that this is um, definitely the case. And somebody who has heart disease, you will find that they are frightened of feeling strong emotion. They are frightened of having sex. They are frightened of all the things that you would take completely for granted because of the pain that they get in the heart because they cannot have that natural surge of extra blood to the heart when they need it. 
And one of the things that will be affected is the nitric oxide production, which again, getting fat out of the diet is very, very, very important, but also loading it with the good stuff in its place is equally important. So what he did in his trials um, with these very severe patients, and Bill Clinton, by the way, a former US president, has now gone vegan because he had a quadruple bypass and was basically going to die. And he saw these two people's work and thought, actually, I don't want to die, so I'm going to go vegan. And what he's recommended and what he's studied over years and years and years was, in his diet, no fat at all, actually, apart from omega-3 through mainly flaxseed. Um, but it was every drop of fat out of the diet. He loaded it with fruits and vegetables, pulses, which is the peas, bees, lentils group, whole grains group, um, which of course is things like whole wheat, oats, um, rye, that kind of food groups, group of foods. Um, nuts were very limited because of the fat content, of course. And that was basically the diet that these people who agreed to go in this clinical trial consumed. And some of them at the beginning were like, you must be joking, I'm not doing that, because the reason they had heart disease is because their diet was as far removed from that as you can possibly imagine. <laughs> um, but those that went into the trial did it properly, and you know, all of them are living years later. Now, he, you should look up Dean Ornish, because the Lifestyle Heart Trial, he took patients, and those, some of them went on basically, in a nutshell, through conventional medicine, which means surgery, drugs, the whole usual uh, way that you would treat very serious heart disease. And the other group went on to the Lifestyle Heart Program, which meant they had stress management, they had um, diet management, and they had the diet very similar to what I've just described. No calorie restriction, by the way, at all. So you didn't have to calorie count, but they were not allowed largely to consume any animal products. So they had to do what I've just said. Um, Oh yes, and they had exercise management as well, so those were the three prongs for his. So they had exercise according to what they could manage. And again, astonishing results, better than anything we've ever seen globally through medicine. So very, very powerful results, you know, got massive re re reduction in bad cholesterol. We got um, the angiogram showing the actual plaques themselves dissolving over time. Most importantly of all, um, massive reduction in pain, by the way, but most importantly of all, the people in the lifestyle group stayed alive. The people who went down the conventional group died at the normal rate, which is very high, actually, when it gets that serious. So that's something you worth having a look at. But just to illustrate that we know there is no silver bullet, there is no magical answer when somebody's got serious heart disease um, or something relating to coronary disease. We know that lifestyle management can fix them, if you like. We know that now. It's just how do we spread this message such that those people that are treating them on a daily basis tell them this. So that's the big challenge, isn't it? So finally, very, very, very quickly, I'll just mention osteoporosis. Look up Professor Jane Plant. She's written Your Life in Your Hands on the Breast Cancer, but she's also written a book on prostate cancer for men and how that relates to diet and one on osteoporosis. So look at Professor Jane Prant. She's British, she's in London. Um, very interesting woman, very, 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 very bright. Um, anyway, on osteoporosis, one of the key things, just before I take some questions, is that, remember I said at the beginning, one of the reasons people give their children milk is the calcium factor, isn't it? We are told that children cannot have strong bones and teeth unless they, produce, unless they um, consume cow's milk in some form or another. And nothing could be further from the truth because, ironically, when you consume an animal product like cow's milk or cow's milk cheese, you're obviously producing something that's high in animal protein, which has an acidifying effect on your bloodstream. And you probably have all heard of this, but it produces or sets up what the World Health Organization referred to as the calciuric effect. And what that means is that basically, yes, you are consuming a lot of calcium in cow's milk. Of course you are, that's true. But at the same time, you're consuming animal protein, which acidifies the blood. And the one thing your system cannot have is a blood that is, at, sorry, that has, um, yeah, well, blood that's out of balance. It has to have homeostasis. It has to have balance. So it will do anything to get back to that balance. So it has to buffer the blood to bring it back to where it wants it to be. And the way that it does that, in a nutshell, is draws calcium out of your bones. 
So the huge irony is that when you study world, worldwide who has the most osteoporosis, is it the people in the United States or is it the people in Thailand, for example? Because in Thailand, cow's milk is, is consumed very, very little. In the United States, it's one of the biggest consumers of cow's milk in the world. So who's going to have the osteoporosis? Because if the industry is telling us the truth and we need cow's milk to prevent it, then you'd expect nobody in the United States to have osteoporosis. And in fact, of course, it's the other way around. Osteoporosis is very prevalent in Western societies that consume loads and loads and loads of cow's milk and cow's milk products, and yet it does not save us. So there's something very serious going on there, and I would suggest it largely has to do with the fact that you're not just consuming calcium, but you're consuming a whole you know, um, set of other factors that don't do you any good whatsoever when you consume that calcium through that means. So all you have to do, of course, for those of you that have got children, <laughs> if you're worried, I mean, for example, soya milk has the same amount of calcium um, if you do it by the actual amount that you give. Um, they've basically set it so that soya milk has the same amount of calcium practically to cow's milk. Um, but lots of the plant milks, you could drink almond milk, hazelnut milk, milk, whatever you want, they're very high in calcium. Um, if you want an equivalent to the milk. But basically, where did we ever get calcium? You know, we never used to consume cow's milk, as I said, until very recently in our evolutionary history. Nor did we consume soy milk, for that matter, until very recently in our evolutionary history. So where were we getting it? Well, it's dark green leafy vegetables. It was the pulses again. You know, it's the nuts and seeds groups. They're very, very high in calcium, and we are absolutely perfectly adapted as a human being to obtain all our calcium from those sources, and those are healthy, safe sources that do not promote, in fact, as you've just heard a little bit, they protect against disease. So I hope today, obviously, it's, you know, I'm just touching upon different areas, but hopefully I've given you something to think about, some websites to look things up a bit more, and some authors to read a bit more, in a bit more detail if you're interested in this topic, and obviously you can contact me, and I'll send, when the pad comes back round, I'll send you all the free packs, and uh, thank you very much indeed for listening.